Okay, uh, good evening. Um, my name is Philip Alston. I'm one of the directors of the NYU Law School's Center for Human Rights and Global Justice. Um, along with my colleagues, Professors Meg Satterthwaite, Brian Goodman, and Sally Engel-Murray, we have a human rights center which seeks to do a lot of work on very traditional human rights issues, uh, what we refer to as civil and political rights issues, standard violations, etc. But we also aim uh, to go well beyond that and to try to situate human rights challenges by looking explicitly at economic, social and cultural rights, for example, and looking at the systemic nature of many of the problems and challenges that arise. Um, the uh, focus tonight on climate change and human rights, uh, looking at the Paris Agreement, uh, exemplifies, of course, that approach, taking one of the single most dramatic challenges to the international community and asking where and how human rights might fit into both the problems and, more importantly, the solutions. Uh, it's with great pleasure uh, tonight uh, that I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Cristiano Figueres. She is the executive secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and has been in that position since 2010. So she has been a key part of the tumultuous years uh, of uh, trying to make up for earlier failings in this area to get an international agreement. Um, she was, before taking this position, uh, a Costa Rican diplomat, a member of the Costa Rican delegation uh, engaged in the climate change uh, discussions. Uh, she founded the Center for Sustainable Development in the Americas in 1995. And she has, as executive secretary, played an absolutely crucial role. Um, executive secretaries in a major area like this are in an impossible situation. Uh, I presume it's a job that you wanted, but it's not a job that uh, uh, anyone would expect to be able to please all of the constituencies. Uh, you're inevitably caught in the middle, as is always the case with senior United Nations officials, uh, with civil society, with various groups pressing in certain directions, governments pressing in other directions, and it's the executive secretary who tries to make things work despite all of the pressures. And Cristiano Figueres has an extremely good reputation as someone who has brought a very positive uh, approach to that, has sought to reach out to be inclusive, and I think we uh, at least know her by her photograph, uh, I guess it's almost an iconic photograph now, uh, of her standing with uh, Francois Hollande, uh, Laurent Fabius, and uh, Ban Ki-moon uh, in Paris, uh, signaling the dramatic conclusion, successful conclusion, uh, of long and protracted negotiations. We're particularly uh, delighted that she's going to address the human rights dimensions of this, where they might fit in. Uh, this is not an easy or even a popular uh, angle. Uh, governments have long been uh, resistant, as they are in many other areas, to trying to recognize the links. Uh, the final agreement has one provision in the preamble uh, which is fairly extensive, but it is in the, 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 the B list or the C list, if you like, in other words, the preamble and not in the substantive part of the agreement. Um, I want to 
uh, before giving the floor to uh, Cristiano Figueres, just to thank my colleagues from the center, particularly Tina Testrupa, who um, conceived of this idea, basically, and pushed it forward, uh, and Audrey Watney, who has done a huge amount of the work in uh, getting all of this uh, organized. Uh, we're going to have a question and answer session uh, after the talk, uh, and we hope that will be genuinely uh, interactive, and I would encourage you to uh, be thinking about questions that you might want to ask in response to the remarks that we're about to hear. So enough from me, um, and a very, very warm welcome to our distinguished guest speaker. Please 
forgive me if I go to my cell phone and go, Mary, what do you think? <laughs> so um, let me start by uh, orienting you with my personal approach to this issue, which you may not share, and that's fine, but it is my, my personal approach. It does seem that the broader issue of climate justice within which we would uh, locate the discussion of uh, human rights and climate change, the broader discussion on climate justice, which is about 20 years old, has evolved into what I would call two schools of thought. On the one hand, there are those who have taken and continue to pursue what I would call the punitive approach uh, to climate justice and who seek sometimes, in fact, quite effectively to look for, uh, is that my phone? Would you mind using the mic? The event is being recorded. Okay, sorry, so is this not going into the mic? Okay, I'm sorry. It's just that, you know, my, my preference is to see people and not just the mic. Can we figure this out, how we can both do the mic and see people? Can you hold it? Oh, hold it. All right. Is this any better? All right. <laughs> okay. Um, so there are those uh, who choose to approach this issue uh, from a punitive um, perspective. Oh, that's much better. Um, and who have, uh, in fact, quite effectively, not always, but sometimes quite effectively chosen judiciary structures to uh, hold countries liable for um, climate justice or, in fact, corporations or whole sectors. And that is uh, probably, I have to tell you, an approach that we have not seen the end to, and I do think that there will be more liability cases coming forward, in particular, now that there is absolutely no question about the impact of climate change, uh, and no one uh, dares question the science anymore, and so those who continue with uh, what to some would be interpreted as irresponsible behavior, I can imagine that we will be seeing more and more uh, liability cases. That's one end, one approach. The other approach I would categorize as being a collaborative approach, uh, where the protection of human rights is certainly front and center, but that goes at this much more from what I personally think is a more constructive approach of not confronting, but rather reaching out to what do we have in common and where can we collaborate to move things forward. I have to tell you very frankly that my personal approach is the second and not the first. Not that the first is wrong. Uh, it certainly serves a very, very valuable purpose. But for me, certainly because I have the responsibility of bringing 195 countries together to a unanimous agreement, uh, I really made up my mind very early in this game that I would choose the collaborative approach for, uh, for two reasons, actually. One is because I frankly feel that it is a more promising way to, uh, to bring climate change and human rights together because they have to be seen together, but also because I think that it is a more pra uh, promising advance on how to develop the new social and economic contract that is going to be the basis for the 21st century. Because it is clear that the social and economic contract of the 20th century uh, will not take us where we need to go. So for both of those reasons, uh, I come at this from one particular approach, and we can talk about the uh, the pros and cons about that later, but I just wanted to be very frank with you uh, as to how I see this. Having said that, I think that we could agree, no matter which way you choose to look at this, which approach you choose, but I think we can agree that there is a macro level relationship between climate change and human rights. 
And what do I mean by that? I mean by that a very, very simple equation, and that is more carbon equals more poverty. Simplistic, but pretty accurate, pretty accurate. The more carbon we put up in the atmosphere, I should say, that, that, that equation should be more carbon in the atmosphere, not necessarily more carbon in the soil, which has a completely different effect. The more carbon in the atmosphere, uh, means more poverty. Why is that? Because the more that we load the atmosphere, and we have already loaded two-thirds of what we can load for the rest of the history of mankind, the more we continue to load, the more we know that we will have expanding areas around the world that are already being converted to and will continue to be converted into wastelands, the higher health costs we're going to have, the less food security that we're going to have, the less water security, on and on and on. Everything that actually determines the very basis of, uh, of human living. So more carbon equals more poverty is a pretty, pretty clear equation. Now, the fact is that that does not apply to energy, right? Because it is very clear that we need energy we need electricity, we need transportation, everything that energy provides us with, we need more of that in order to get those that are at extreme levels of poverty out of those unacceptable levels. But we don't need the fossil fuel that is currently attendant to energy. And that's the difference. We cannot equate energy with carbon. In fact, if you want to bring the Paris Agreement, or in fact, the entire Climate Change Convention, to a very, very simplistic one sentence, it is the challenge to decouple growth, GDP, from fossil fuels. Because we have been on a trajectory now for years in which the curve on GDP has always meant the same curve in the same direction at the same speed as GHG, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and that is no longer acceptable. That is exactly the delinking or the decoupling that the convention is all about and that the Paris Agreement promises. So to decouple uh, carbon from growth is actually the wedge that we need to put into this equation because if we don't, what we would be talking about is increasing social and economic inequality around the world. So I come back to the very, very clear equation, more carbon equals more poverty as a macro relationship. Interestingly enough, the reverse of that, the converse of that is not necessarily true. I wish that we could say zero carbon equals zero poverty. And I wish that that were true because I do think that we're now, for a change, on a very, very good trajectory of getting to what we call zero carbon, which is not completely zero, but it does mean peaking greenhouse gas emissions by 2020, uh, if not sooner, and a net zero equation where by 2050 where we would not be emitting into the atmosphere any more than we are naturally able to absorb. That is the net zero carbon concept that is actually embedded into the Paris Agreement, uh, quite contrary to many people's expectations. Even one or two years ago, they said, oh, forget it, you know, long-term goal, net zero, you'll never get that in. Uh, and through the very, very hard work of many, many people, in particular many women, uh, it is really quite fantastic that we have that now inserted and embedded in the Paris Agreement. So that's the zero carbon. Now, could we argue that zero carbon or net zero carbon is equals zero poverty? Unfortunately, not. Because poverty, or at least lifting and eradicating extreme poverty around the world, depends not just on energy. It is one of the major causes, but there are other factors that would have to be, uh, be taken into, into consideration. So if we were to take the first equation more carbon equals more poverty and turn it around, the most that we could say is zero carbon equals less poverty. Not zero poverty, 
but certainly less poverty, which is not bad. That is not bad given the fact that we have full control over how much carbon we put into the atmosphere. We have full control because we have policies at hand, because we have technologies at hand, um, and because we have the capital that needs to respond to our decisions. So we have full control over how much carbon we put up there. And we know, of course, that coming to this zero net emissions balance is the only way that we have uh, to, eradicate, uh, to eradicate poverty or at least make that possible. Um, and the other relationship, and then I will move on, but I, I do want to instill this relationship uh, in us tonight. The other very, very interesting uh, equation here is that it is only through eradicating extreme poverty that we are able to provide at least that part of the population, the most vulnerable, with a fighting chance, a fighting chance against the negative impacts of climate change. People that are in extreme poverty conditions have no possibility to resist, be resilient, or in fact even survive in many cases the negative impacts of climate change, zero. So that is uh, a situation that, uh, that we cannot morally allow to continue into this 21st century and hence uh, the relation, the macro level relationship between climate change and human rights is very, very clear. Could I then move on to um, moving from the macro to the more individual uh, human rights? And I will not attempt in this audience particularly to go through the entire uh, gamut of human rights, even uh, all of the economic, social, cultural. Um, but I will actually be guided tonight in my conversation with you by the Sustainable Development Goals that were also just adopted by the United Nations uh, just in September of last year, and that certainly reflect, perhaps not 100%, but certainly reflect uh, to a great extent what we understand to be basic human values. And here as we go through, and I'm going to choose some of them, the most salient ones and the ones that are most relevant to the, uh, to the climate change uh, challenge, um, I wanted to first uh, point to the relationship between climate change and some of those SDGs, and I'll call them SDG Sustainable Development Goals. And here is what I would like to propose to you. There has been a long discussion, academic, political, economic, social, cultural discussion about are the SDGs one thing and climate change another. Are they separated? Are they separable? Should they be separated? I am of the opinion that are they are one and the same to a certain extent, to a certain extent. I would argue that what climate does to the SDGs, at least all of those that are relevant to the discussion, is a twofold impact. Climate sets the direction in which we must pursue these SDGs first. And secondly, it sets the pace. Neither of that would be there with the SDGs were it not for the fact that we're all now living in a completely changed climate and that we will all be experiencing many more negative impacts. Uh, it's gonna get much worse before it gets better. So let me go through that with you and exemplify uh, what is uh, perhaps a, a, a very generalized statement. Let me take energy, which is one of the sustainable development goals. Well, it's very clear that if we didn't have, let's put, you know, climate change now to the side, the only priority on the SDG for energy would be to produce enough energy for everybody in the world. That is actually already a huge, uh, a huge goal. However, when you overlay that with the fact that we're living under climate change conditions, then it's not just about providing everyone with energy. It's about changing the energy matrix to a clean energy matrix and to providing 1.3 billion people 
who still immorally do not have access to energy, immorally, providing them with clean energy, not with dirty energy, and to be able to respond in particular to developing countries who are just coming at the cusp, or just at the cusp, of their economic uh, development spurt, uh, providing them with clean energy on their grids. So that is the overlay of the direction. Yes, we have to provide energy, but it has to be clean energy, because otherwise we're not attending to the, uh, to the climate uh, urgency. Another one, economic growth, another sustainable development um, goal. Well, it's very clear that we have to lift people out of poverty. It's very clear that we have to have more economic growth, in particular, that that needs to be more inclusive. That's very clear. But it's also very clear if you overlay with climate, because otherwise we wouldn't have the direction, it's also very clear that that economic growth needs to be clean. It cannot be the same carbon intensity that we have had for the past 100 years. And just to put it into numbers for you, uh, the last analysis that I looked at says that for every unit of GDP that we will be producing in the near future, we're going to have to extract 10 to 15 times the, uh, the carbon value out of every unit of GDP. That means for every ton of carbon, we need to make it so much more effective. We need to eke out of every ton, of every gram of carbon that we're going to emit, we need to eke out 10 to 15 times the GDP worth, the growth worth, the, the value, the true value for society out of, uh, every, uh, out of every unit of uh, carbon dioxide emissions. That is a very different understanding to economic growth than what we had even 10 to 15 years ago. My third example, another SDG, is uh, industrial innovation and infrastructure. Well, without climate, you can imagine that we're talking about industrial innovation, you know, based on all of our new technology, on, you know, um, cut, having cutting edge technologies in every single sector, which we will have uh, in an unprecedented pace. Um, but, with the climate overlay, there's a very clear direction that wouldn't be there without climate. And the clear direction is we need industrial innovation, but in particular, we need industrial innovation that is going to help us grow cleanly. And that is the most urgent. And all industrial innovation from now on should be looking at that goal. How are we going to grow in a clean fashion without having the environmental impact that we have had an infrastructure? part of that sustainable development goal? Well, guess what? That kind of infrastructure that was solid, a solid, unmovable infrastructure cannot continue to be built. The infrastructure from now on needs to be resilient infrastructure. Roads, buildings, um, electric, uh, electric distribution, all infrastructure, all fixed assets that we will be building from now on need to be resilient. Why? Because of the negative impacts of climate. No infrastructure in any country in the world is exempt from being impacted negatively by some, uh, by some uh, natural event, extreme natural event. So to the engineers, they have a major, uh, a major task ahead to be able to produce infrastructure that is resilient and that is water efficient, energy efficient, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, the whole green architecture uh, chapter there. My fourth example. My fourth example, cities and communities, another SDG goal. Well, without climate, we would have perhaps more cities, but with climate, we have to have more livable cities. I'm talking about organic cities that are actually producing as much or almost as much food as they would need to, uh, to consume. Cities that are producing enough energy or as much energy as they would need to consume. Buildings that are not bringing in you know, uh, energy through these stupid uh, 20th century wires that we have everywhere even though they're under, under, uh, under the earth. But Every building should actually be energy independent, or in fact, energy positive. And we will get there. We will get there actually quite, quite, uh, quite quickly. So a very different concept, and for urban planners, a very different concept 
of what it means to plan, build, and, um, and regulate uh, cities with respect to their energy use, with respect to transportation. Completely different view of transportation now. Uh, and, and if you want to enjoy a fantastic view of what transportation is gonna look like, I very much recommend that you uh, take a look at what Mary Barra, the CEO of, uh, of General Motors, uh, just said a few days ago coming out of Davos of her vision of what mobility is going to be in just the next five to 10 years. Completely revolutionized from, uh, from where we are. And my final example here for you of the SDGs and the, uh, the direction that is being overlaid on the SDGs because of climate is of course consumption and production which is perhaps just the, uh, the, the summary of all of the above because we cannot continue to consume more than we produce. We have gone way beyond planetary boundaries. As you've all heard, uh, we actually will be needing two planets if we continue with the consumption levels and the, with the carbon intensity uh, consumption levels that we have. Um, and production is gonna have to get much more resilient. We're gonna have to uh, develop water uh, resi or drought resistant uh, agriculture. We're gonna have to develop very, very different types of production, uh, in particular in the food sector. So very different, a very clear direction being overlaid and being imposed, if you will, superimposed on the SDGs because of climate change that wasn't there before. Now, all of this, is about the direction. But then there are some SDG goals that yes, they have the direction, but they have the other factor that I warned you about. I told you speed and pace. And let me just say, the pace with which we successfully undertake all of the above, dramatically changing our cities, dramatically changing our energy structure, dramat dramatically changing how we grow, how we innovate, what kind of infrastructure we do, uh, and how we consume and produce. The pace with which we do that will determine whether we're able to address climate change. That is the ticking clock in climate change. Climate change is also one of the SDG goals, it's number 13, but it is the only SDG, the only one, that has an inbuilt physical time bomb. All of the others, if you take morality and human rights away and put them in some box, which we don't, but if you did, mental, uh, mental exercise here, all of the others could, in theory, move along quite happily at some pace. And we would all be happy when the world is less poor and when everybody has more water and when everybody has more food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There is no deterministic timing to those SDG goals. There is a timing within climate change. If we are not able to get to global peaking, that means the highest point of all greenhouse gas emissions, globally, all countries together, and then by 2020, and then descend very quickly to the point where we're at net zero by 2050, the, the effects on the planet, the physical impacts on this planet are such that we may not be able to even manage them, let alone rescue the most vulnerable out of, uh, out of a misery that is frankly untenable and even undescribable. So it is not just the direction that climate gives to these SDGs, our proxy tonight for human rights, it is also the speed. We're on a five year track here. By 2020, we must be able to stand up and say, we actually have turned the corner. And if we don't, if we don't, we will all of us living here, will have to respond to our children that we actually knew what we were doing because we all do. And we chose not to stand up to our responsibility. That would be a terrible scenario that none of us uh, would ever want to, uh, to face. And you can imagine that if we're not able to do that, the effects 
on poverty, on inequality, on disruption, uh, on food, on water, on territory, on forced immigration, forced migration, would be so terrible that we would never be able to reach peace. And so, if you will, all of this summarized is for me uh, that the Climate Change Convention, including its now uh, soon to be legally binding Paris Agreement, yes, is a convention on climate change, but it is fundamentally a convention of human rights and it is a convention of peace because all of that belongs together and no one should ever separate them. Thanks. Do you want me to do questions here or there? <laughs> We can get your driver to come in if you like. Yes. <laughs> uh, where do you want to, do you want to stand there? That's okay. I, why don't want I sit up? But I'll take the microphone because otherwise we'll get scolded again. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Um, is that, yeah, that is working. Uh, okay, so I would um, ask those with questions to keep it uh, reasonably concise, not to make a statement. Uh, and perhaps we'll take three questions at a time and then uh, a chance to respond. So, please. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you so much for being here with us and sharing your uh, thoughts and wisdom with us. My name's Albert Karcher. I uh, am currently working with the uh, CDP, the Carbon Disclosure Project. And so we work closely with cities on climate change. So uh, that point is particularly interesting for me. Um, but personally, Something I'm very interested in is uh, mindfulness and also the idea of kind of interconnection uh, with ecology and kind of our responsibility, um, as you said, kind of a, a moral responsibility to act. Um, and so when we look at the issue of climate change and human rights, I mean, they're so closely linked. Um, and one of the challenges I find is kind of what, what do we do today? So it would be wonderful if you could speak to how each of us can kind of act in our daily lives to start taking steps. Thanks. Uh, my name is Lisa DiCaprio. I'm a professor of social sciences at NYU. I'm also involved in the campaign for divesting fossil fuels um, from the New York City pension funds, the New York State pension fund, and also NYU Divest. And you had mentioned um, that we need to keep two-thirds of fossil fuels in the ground. You have also appealed to institutional investors to invest a certain percentage of their uh, funds in green infrastructure and clean technologies. And I wonder if you could expand on that point. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stephen Mance. I'm an environmental organizer with the Coffee Party. Um, I just wanted to respectfully express one perhaps objection or constructive criticism to your speech. You, you gave a very eloquent overview of the whole issue of climate change, but I don't feel that much more enlightened, only because I feel like you didn't really touch upon any of the specifics. Like China is saying it emits this much, they just found it emits that much. India says they need growth, and they're objecting us having standards that America won't adhere to, didn't adhere to during its own growth. America is slowly waking up because we have extreme weather. So, I mean, the UN is presenting itself as the arbiter of the world's response to climate change. I applaud that 1,000%, but we're gonna get serious about climate change when the UN comes to us, and I consider us to be your constituents. We need to hear what you're doing. We need to hear what you're working on and what we need to work on. I didn't hear you mention India, China. I didn't hear you mention West Europe. We need to know who's the worst offenders, what we need to do, and we need to know what you, our elected and appointed representatives, are doing about the specific problems, about the multinational corporations, about the developing world that has legitimate grievances but also needs to control its emissions. So I respect, I, I do applaud you for coming here and I'm very grateful. However, I have to expect, express this respectfully and again, I'm your constituent. That's the context which I'm saying it. So I appreciate that and I hope you can address that. Thank you. Okay, uh, perhaps we'll then uh, give uh, Ms. Figueres an opportunity to respond to those 
questions. Is that okay? Sure. Um, before we so take let me some take more. That fantastic question first. Um, thanks very much. Um, so you know the the, uh, the fact is that I could stand here for about fifty hours and go through the Paris Agreement, or in fact go through 20 years of climate negotiations, but I don't think that was the invitation that I had tonight. But I'm happy to give you a quick summary. There has been a long-standing discussion, as you can imagine, between, and here is a way oversimplified uh, summary, um, a standing discussion between developing countries, of which I am one, I come from Costa Rica, so I'm a developing country representative, uh, between developing countries and industrialized countries about responsibility. We call it in the climate lingo, uh, we call it uh, common but differentiated responsibilities because there are common responsibilities that we all share. But it's very, very clear that there is a historical difference here. Nobody denies, and it's not even, you know, it's, it's not ideology, it's just simple physics. Nobody denies that industrialized countries this one in particular is historically much more responsible for the concentrations of greenhouse gases that we have in the air than anybody else. So that is not questioned. It was questioned for a long time, I have to tell you. And it took a long time for countries to be able to come to the point where they said, okay, we accept historical responsibility and it is not going to stop us from getting together in a collaborative fashion to look for solution for the future. Because if you allow the past to keep you frozen in the past, you will never be able to find a solution for the future. So one of the many miracles of the Paris Agreement is that countries were very, very clear about honoring historical responsibility and at the same time being willing to move into a much more solution-oriented space in collaboration with each other. The developing countries that you mentioned, China, absolute star, absolute leader. We would have a different world, certainly on climate change, if everybody were putting in forth the kinds of policies that China is putting forward. India having a much more difficult time, why? Because India is about 10 to 15 years behind China in development and hence has a much, much more difficult time with the decoupling of, uh, of greenhouse gases from GDP. Having said that, you need to know that not only was the Paris Agreement adopted unanimously by 195 countries, in addition to that, we in the Secretariat have received 188 national climate change plans from 188 countries representing 95% of the countries, 85% of greenhouse gas emissions, because they wanted to, because they came to the conclusion that it was actually in their interest to address climate change, in their interest. That is a huge, huge uh, movement away from where we were just five, four years ago, where there was a blaming going on. And Yes, there's responsibility, but we now have agreed that everybody will take on some responsibility, differentiated responsibility, into the future. I could go on for a thousand years uh, about the intricacies of the Paris Agreement, but if your question was about the dynamic between developed and developing countries, I don't think it's solved, but certainly we do have a very, very good step forward on that. Um, on divest and invest, another movement uh, that is, has been incredibly helpful uh, because this really is about shifting capital. Whatever capital, wherever capital goes over the next five years is going to determine the quality of the energy system. You know, I'm going to stand up because I can't see you. What, wherever capital is invested over the next five years is going to determine the quality of the energy system, global energy system, over the next 25 years. And that will determine the quality of life on this planet for the next hundreds of years. So very, very important where this capital goes. And, uh, and thank you uh, for, for working on that movement. And the fantastic news there is that by the time we went to Paris, uh, the divest movement had actually already mobilized, had moved from the very humble beginnings of uh, millions of dollars to three 
$3.4 trillion. $3.4 trillion that are coming from institutional investors, uh, wealthy individuals, and, uh, and, and some other institutions uh, because they have understood that they cannot continue to put that capital into uh, hydrocarbon, in particular high carbon hydrocarbons, uh, which are severely at risk. And if any of you know the literature on stranded assets, you will understand that argument. So very, very important and uh, huge contribution. And I just come actually right now from a long day of discussions at the United Nations at something called the Investor Summit, where the investors of the world, uh, representing almost $23 trillion, came together for one day uh, to discuss how are they going to move that, uh, that forward uh, and be able to shift the capital on time. So yes, uh, thank you to everybody who's working on that. And the job is not done, okay? We have started and we have to continue to move. And on mindfulness, thank you very much for that question also. Uh, I uh, happen to be a student of Thich Nhat Hanh, and so mindfulness is, uh, is very uh, important to me and has honestly been what kept me alive for six years. I cannot begin to explain to you the pressure uh, that we have been under where we have been holding the full responsibility of this negotiation, knowing that we were already late, knowing that we should have come to this global agreement five or 10 years ago, knowing that we're trying to catch up, uh, following Copenhagen, which I call the most successful disaster of the United <laughs> Nations, uh, but from which we learned a lot, um, and holding that responsibility and not have any direct authority over it. I mean, that's a pretty amazing situation to be in because each of these governments are absolutely sovereign and they can decide whatever they want to decide. So, you know, without any disrespect to, to these governments, but to bring them all together over a six year period to where they were willing to work with each other, to listen to each other, and to come to a very <coughs> clear decision that the blame game is not gonna take them forward and that they need to collaborate. That's a, that's a pretty daunting task. Uh, and mindfulness and the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh uh, really kept me, kept me going. To your question about, um, about what can we as individuals do? Well, first of all, we can be mindful about every single thing that we do during the day. Every single thing. There is nothing, I guarantee you, there is nothing that you do, including sleep, that is not somehow related to energy use, in particular in this kind of a country. That is not true for some developing countries, okay? But in this country and in all industrialized countries, everything that you do, everything that you do, every step you take, every morsel you eat, every widget you get into your hand, every transportation that you do, everything is somehow related to energy. So figure that out. Be much more aware of the fact that we're irresponsibly using energy. And we are responsibly using the kind of energy that we're using. And we can change all of that. You can change your energy use. Uh, you can vote with your wallet. You can vote with your, with your vote. Uh, and you can get the kind of political leadership that we have now finally seen in this country and that we could see everywhere else. So certainly with our personal, uh, with our personal footprint and uh, with, our, uh, with our power as consumers and our Thank you for bringing 195 countries to sign this agreement. Thank you so much. This is, this is truly a turning point for the climate and for our planet, and I thank you. Um, I was in Rio Plus 20, Lima. I have work on the SDGs this summer. And um, I must say that this was, Paris was one of the most exciting events I've ever been to in terms of learning, the enthusiasm from the mayors, from CEOs, from grassroots. Uh, it, it was just so stimulating. And I felt that all of those sectors, government and all those that I've mentioned, came together in a very positive, meaningful way. And um, I'm uplifted by the strength of the global grassroots movement and I have two, two questions. Uh, one, innovation and how we share this with one another. For example, I was recently at an architectural event 
And we could, I asked this question, could we have a new building that was a microgrid? And they said yes. Microgrid. In other words, the building itself supplies its energy. There's nothing going in, nothing coming out. To, to your point that we have to be able to sustain our food and our energy. So when these developments come along, how best can we communicate them with one another so that we can move at the pace that's necessary to accomplish our goals, reach that five years, give the Earth a chance to take a breath and recoup her ability to absorb carbon? And my second question is, how do you suggest that the global gr grassroots movement can have the most impact in helping this process along? Thank you. I'm Rick Clugston. I'm with the Center for Earth Ethics at Union Theological Seminary. And I, too, feel that these two large UN events, the adoption of Agenda 2030 and the Paris Climate Agreement were really profoundly transformative moments. And uh, I, too, congratulate you and the, and the co-facilitators of the SDG process. Remarkable leadership. Um, I have two questions. Uh, we just, the, the, the SDGs, the, the, the targets are set, the 17 targets are set, the 169, um, I mean, the, the goals are set and the 169 targets are set. But now we need indicators. And the expert group has released a draft of the indicators, and the UN Statistical Commission will release the, the almost final draft um, in March. Looking through the initial draft at the indicators, it's, it's rather sobering, frightening for me that so few of them actually embrace that direction that you're talking about. Very few really talk about sustainability. Most of them are still within that old paradigm business as usual. Uh, and so I'm, I'm wondering how you and how people that are involved in, in trying to really create this new context can, can weigh in on the indicators. So that's question one. And the second one really is, uh, it looks like if all 188 countries actually met their uh, individually determined goals for, for uh, carbon reduction, <coughs> we'd still be up at about 2.7 degrees Celsius. And so if uh, 1.5 degree would be great, uh, even two would be, but how do we, how do we, because not all 188 are going to fully implement what they've committed to. I mean, that's highly unlikely, uh, but even if they did, we'd still be only halfway, roughly halfway, to where we want to get. So I, I'm curious about how, how you're thinking of strategizing and moving over the next five years to get to that peak moment. Thank you. Hi, Christiana. My name is Alyssa Jolm from the Center for International Environmental Law, and I've been following the process and in your work for quite some time. So thank you for the tremendous effort that you and many others have made and for this incredible accomplishment. I wanted to sort of bring us back to the, to the issue that we were, are here to discuss human rights and climate change, and that's really the focus of my work and the way that I engage in the UNFCCC process. And as I'm sure you're well aware, there was this unprecedented civil society coalition that came together, cross-constituency coalition, women and gender, indigenous peoples groups, environmental groups, climate justice groups, trade unions. I mean, this really was unprecedented. Uh, there's not much that all these groups can agree on, but they did find a common ground in human rights. So there was this strong and you know powerful push for human rights to be included in the operative text. And as, we, as Professor Alston mentioned, this was not the outcome that we achieved. We ended up with a, a reference, a strong reference in the preamble, but not in the operative text. And I was wondering if you could just share any insider perspectives you have on what happened in those final days. I mean, we did have a reference in, I believe, the second to last draft text that was released on, on Thursday night, on Human Rights Day, um, was the draft in which it was deleted. So I wanted to ask if you could share some perspectives on that. Thank you. So do we take um, those questions? Um, so first of all, yes, I, I fully agree that this was absolutely unprecedented uh, uh, coming together of all stakeholder groups, you know, left, right, 
top, bottom. I mean, there was not a constituency that was not uh, that was not mobilized, and I was truly, deeply, deeply grateful uh, grateful for that. Um, why did we end up with human rights in the um, in the preamble and not in the operative paragraphs? I don't think it is a secret to you who follow human rights that uh, there is there there just isn't complete universal agreement about uh, human rights and how they uh, how they should be interpreted or how they should be practiced. And I think it was quite. Uh, Quite a difficult situation there where we clearly had the majority of countries who could have gone with that. But this agreement could not be adopted by the majority of countries. It needed to be adopted universally. It needed to be adopted unanimously. And for that reason, uh, some issues were uh, had to be put into the preamble because otherwise, there would have been a danger of losing the entire agreement. And uh, a decision was made better to have it at least there, and this doesn't apply only to human rights. There are several other issues in that category. Let's have it there, uh, and, uh, and because we certainly didn't want to let it go, uh, but it would not have been able to, to go forward in the operative paragraphs. I don't see that as the final situation. You know, I'm, I'm ever hopeful and ever positive, uh, and uh, now that we have that, and we have actually uh, an ambitious list there, not just human rights, but a listing of specific, uh, specific sub, sub issues on human rights. Uh, you know, I, I'm very hopeful that future legal documents under the Climate Change Convention will be able to take that forward as the world uh, matures and its understanding of that. Um, but it was because of the need for unanimity. Um, on the INDC, sorry, I'm going you know from the top to the bottom. On the INDC is the uh, intended nationally determined contributions. As I mentioned before, there are 188 of them, uh, and each of them come from the strength of uh, the analyses that each country has made as to the reality, their political, technical, financial, and, and regulatory reality, and how can they, um, how can they contribute. Uh, we were the ones, in fact, who, who did that uh, assessment to aggregate all of those plans and came up with this uh, 2.7 degrees in, in coordination with UNEP. Um, and so we are the first ones to, uh, to be very, very clear about the fact that all of these uh, intentions, all of these climate change plans are fundamental and key, but are not enough. Close but no cigar, right? Uh, they are very, very important first step, but they are not enough. They do take us off the trajectory where we were, going toward a global warming by the end of the century of four to five degrees, by some estimates six degrees. So we're off of that track, thank heavens, and we're now on to a trajectory of 2.7. So there is definitely a very important dent that has been made by those, uh, by those climate change, assuming that they're fully implemented, but it is not enough to keep us well below two degrees, as the Paris Agreement says, or to pursue our efforts at 1.5. So what was done about that? is to recognize that transforming, in particular, the energy, but also the land use management, but the energy system of the world uh, is not something that you do by the stroke of a pen, and certainly not at one conference, even if it lasts you know, two torturous weeks. Um, so that it, it was understood that this has got to be a multi-decadal process. It took us 150 years to get to this mess. Well, it's gonna take us two decades to get us out of there. And the Paris Agreement, therefore, very different to any other legal instrument under the, under the convention, the Kyoto Protocol, for example, does not establish just a finite number of years and a finite target. It actually is meant to be a multi-decadal process that doesn't have an end date, that actually has what we call a ratcheting up mechanism whereby countries will come together around the table again every five years to assess where they are in their transformation and then be able to bring higher efforts to the table. So if you will, from management, if, if any of you are management students, uh, continuous uh, improvement is a, is a very important principle in management, and the same principle is being inserted here, has been inserted into the Paris Agreement where this is a process of continuous improvement. So every five years we will be seeing the tightening of targets and, and that will devolve 
into the tightening of regulation buttressed by the evolution of technology, the shift of capital, um, and, uh, and the, the, the continual development of regulation at the national level. So it will take us a while to get there, um, but, uh, but the intent is to come to well below two degrees uh, and hopefully 1.5. <coughs> do I think that we're gonna make it? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Because uh, everything that we have ever done, I have incredible hope uh, and trust in technology. And everything that we've ever done in technology, we've actually been able to surpass whatever we thought. You know, when computers were first put on the market, you know, the uh, uh, personal computers, the, you know, the estimate was, oh, we'll never have more than one million computers. Well, same thing with cell phones, okay? We have over complied, over stretched anything in, on, on technology that we thought was going to be possible, and I think we're gonna be doing the same thing here. Um, and finally, on, um, oh no, two, two more questions, SDGs and what to do about the indicators. Yes, fully agree with that, and it is one of our huge concerns. And you know, uh, despite the fact that, uh, that, I, uh, that I have huge respect for the principles and the operations of the institution that I serve, uh, of the United Nations, I must say, in its infinite wisdom, the United Nations committed the mistake many years ago, its member states committed many years ago the mistake of separating these two things, and they separated development from climate change. For very understandable reasons, very understandable reasons, and if I had been there at that point, I probably would have done exactly the same thing. And the negotiations of the SDGs went on one track, which I would call a, uh, an aspirational track because it's not legally binding and the climate change convention is a legally binding treaty and had to negotiate a legally binding instrument under that treaty. So it's understandable that we had two different tracks. Now, however, when we get to implement, these two tracks need to converge again. And I am deeply grateful that the Secretary General has actually named uh, Dr. David Navarro to bring these two tracks together and uh, I'm actually working with him to see what, what are we are gonna do about that. Because those indicators need to incorporate the sustainability because otherwise uh, we're just not gonna get them. It is, you know, it, it is just suicidal to pursue those SDGs without their sustainability because they just will never be accomplished as I've discussed with you at the beginning of this conversation. Um, and finally, but a work in progress, very much of a work in progress. And finally, um, what we can do to communicate innovation. Well, you know, fortunately, uh, we live in, in, in a world, a universe of just the most incredible uh, communication skills and, and potentials. And I have no doubt uh, that everything that is invented, I mean, you all know what Tesla is doing, you all know uh, what GM is doing. You know, I, I, I mean, the, the fact is, if you follow any of the social media over all of them, in which case you wouldn't have time to do anything else in your lives. <laughs> Um, but if you follow any of the social media, then you're up to date with, uh, with innovations and what's happening. And that's a good thing. And that's a good thing. The more complicated thing is not, not just understanding what innovation is doing for us, but actually making that technological innovation accessible to developing countries. That is the big challenge. How do you make those innovations? Because typically, when you have an innovation, it typically comes at the market at the, uh, at the highest end of the cost curve, very, very expensive and it doesn't come down until you have uh, uh, a certain critical mass uh, volume that actually helps to bring costs down. Typical example, solar panels now being distributed massively uh, throughout the world and hence their cost has come down uh, so dramatically. But that's the kind of thing that we need to see in, uh, in all other um, sectors. And to what the grass movement can do, stick together. It took us so many years to come together uh, and to agree that yes, we all approach this from a different point of view, but we have one common goal, one common goal, and that is to get to climate neutrality, to get to climate stability, if you will, to recapture our climate stability for the most vulnerable who are alive today and for everyone who will be coming after today. So stick together. It's not just, you know, everybody coming together for Paris was fantastic, uh, but we need to be able to maintain that unity of purpose. Hello, 
Hello, my name is Katharina Wahl. I've worked for Human Rights Watch um, and I've been followers following the UNFCCC negotiations and I think you just gave the perfect um, transition to my question, which is um, basically now that we have this recogni recognition of human rights in the preamble and we also have all the countries that are parties to the UNFCCC and to the new Paris Agreement that are already all of them are parties to um, human rights treaties. I think that's also very important that it's not a new um, obligation here. And now my question is, um, what do we do with this now? So how do we implement these obligations in the context of climate change policies? And what do you think needs to happen for this? And I, I think specifically for you, the question is what do you think, what contribution can the Secretariat make to these discussions? How do you think we think we can move on with, with this important piece um, of the success, I think, of climate change policy. Can you be more specific? How do we move on with what? what well, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, now that we have, yeah, now that we have uh, rec recognition in the Paris Agreement, what do you think um, can happen and what kind of contribution do you see at the global negotiations? What it, what we've seen with the gender um, discussions, for example, that you know have been more prominent of the past couple of years, um, where I think the, the discussions um, have moved on, and I'm I'm wondering, um, what do you think is the contribution that the secretariat can make, and then of course if you also if you have time, also the the countries and the businesses to to this um, discussion. Hi, my name is Noam. I'm uh, in strategic communications. I was really interested <clears throat> in the beginning how you framed and began the discussion of climate change uh, with talk about connecting with poverty. More carbon in the atmosphere equals more poverty. And I was wondering what the thinking was in, in creating that or in framing the discussion of climate change that way. Certainly one of the difficulties with climate change or solving climate change is in how you talk about it and how you tell people about it and get people to change. Um, and so I, th the way I think about it on a daily basis is climate change poses a threat to the human race. I mean, why not frame it as climate change poses uh, a risk and, and threatens the very existence of humanity? Um, certainly from a legal perspective as well, it seems like it would make sense. I'm not a law student, but uh, according to John Locke and the UN, um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 3, is right to life comes first. And so I just wonder what uh, the, 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 the framing of the environmentalism or the uh, climate change, uh, what went into that. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for being here and thank you for your work. My name is David Cantor. I'm a professor in the Department of Environmental Studies. I have to admit my question isn't as profound as the ones that have gone before me. I'm more interested in a, in a little gossip, actually. I would... I would, I would. Professors always ask for gossip. They do, but never at a microphone. Um, <laughs> um, I would love, and I hope I'm not alone in this, but I would just love to hear your take on Paris as a, as just a person in that maelstrom of craziness. What it was like, and if you can just share a couple of anecdotes or stories with us about your experience there, because it was such a momentous occasion. Thanks. So it was three questions. Should I just ask mine now as well? Sure. Okay. Um, so my name is uh, Maryam al Dabbar. I'm an LLM here uh, in environmental and energy law, and I come from Saudi Arabia, which has an interesting relationship with both climate change and human rights. Um, but so my question. Exactly, yes, absolutely. Um, so my question arose from one of the lines in your talk, which was that the socioeconomic contract of the 21st century is not gonna take us where we need to go. So some or many would argue that included among that, you know, everything that that means is the structure of our entire global economic system. And um, I was, you know, really happy to hear you mentioning sustainable consumption as well because that's something that is often just swept under the rug and ignored. Um, and including with that, it's just that a lot of developing countries don't have a model for how they're going to, you know, cleanly, this, this concept of clean growth. And so all of these issues that are interconnected, um, 
it seems, so first of all, multinational corporations are not gonna like this because it threatens their essential, you know, the business model that they've been going on. And sustainable consumption isn't just gonna be brought about by like the individual actions that we all take. Shorter showers is not going to, you know, save the planet. So basically my question is by... Maybe some friendships. <laughs> <laughs> right. So basically, this is my question. If we're not going to confront these entrenched powers and we're not going to ask the tough questions and we're not gonna examine, you know, how is infinite growth possible on a finite planet? If we're not gonna ask ourselves all of these, how can we hope to resolve this enormous, enormous problem? Because I feel like a lot of the times it's just glossed over and it's like, okay, this is what we have to do, but what's gonna get us there? Is everyone here gonna, you know, agree on changing their lifestyle and cutting consumption? Is industry going to, you know, IKEA said just recently, we've reached peak stuff in the developed world. So, you know, how are the realities, and you still have corporations aiming for, we're gonna grow the next quarter, we're gonna keep on growing. So, anyway, sorry if, that, if I started rambling, but, you know, that's, it's, it's a really complex topic and I would really appreciate like a, a transparent, you know, confrontational, you know, answer that really addresses these issues respectfully. And thank you so much. <laughs> respectfully confrontational. <laughs> um, so thanks for all of that. Um, so uh, next steps on human rights and in the negotiations. Um, well, I guess I, a two-part answer to that. Um, we don't expect that there's going to be another legally binding document, uh, we hope not, uh, negotiated in quite a few years uh, because the whole intent of the Paris Agreement is to be a multi-decadal framework, uh, legally binding framework for, for countries. So um, we, if your interest is in text, now we will be moving to what we call the rule book uh, which is how, what are the rules going to be for the implementation and the, uh, and, and the achievement of the Paris Agreement. Um, and there's certainly space there as we move into implementation. There certainly is a lot of space to make sure that all of that implementation will be according to all of the aspirations of the preamble, uh, which is uh, quite, a, quite, quite a thick set there of aspirations. So that's one part into the text, and I know that in this, uh, in, this, uh, in, in this audience, uh, those legal texts are very important. And, and, my sense is that uh, while the legal texts certainly guide us, it is only the implementation on the ground, where the rubber hits the ground, that we actually know, are, is this actually being implemented, is this actually being turned into reality, or is it a legal text that we could, you know, just put on any shelf? Uh, and therefore, that's why I went through those uh, SDGs with you, because the way in which we attack those, the way in which we achieve them, is going to determine whether we're being respectful uh, with the ultimate human right, which is life, and I sort of totally agree with that, because of the, um, of the uh, reasoning that I gave you before. So I think both on the practical side, as well as on the legal side of, uh, uh, of legal writings, there is still a lot to, uh, to be done, uh, but not just on climate change, right? I think we can agree that the world still has not matured uh, universally on its uh, understanding of human rights, and, uh, and that still is, uh, is work in progress that we all uh, need to work on. Um, why did I start by saying no carbon or less carbon, less poverty? Because of the following, I completely agree that, uh, that climate change is probably, or for sure, uh, certainly in this century, the greatest threat that we've ever had to the existence of humanity. Completely agree. And at the same time, I think that we can agree that industrialized countries have much more of a possibility to defend lives in their countries than developing countries. It's just not a level playing field. It is just not a level playing field. 
Let's just go to Sandy, okay? This fantastic city recovered from Sandy very quickly, very quickly, because this country can do that and has that luxury. Now you go and you have a storm like Sandy on any of the Pacific Islands, which they do, and that wipes out, it wipes out their entire infrastructure on the entire island. It wipes out their entire GDP growth for one year in a storm of 24 hours. It's a very different situation. Very, very different conditions. So the capacity to respond, the, um, the financial capacity, the technical capacity, the institutional capacity is very different in developing countries than it is in industrialized countries. And that is fundamental that we understand that. That is one of the embedded, unf most deeply felt unfairnesses, is that a word in there, unfairnesses, um, of climate change, because those are the countries that are least responsible for it. And those are the countries that are suffering the most. And the vulnerable populations in those countries suffer the most squarely. And they are absolutely exempt <coughs> of any responsibility in the past, in the present, and probably in the future. So those that are most exempt, past, present, and future, are the ones that are most impoverished. Those are the ones under the line of extreme poverty. And that is why I started by saying more carbon, more poverty, because of the difference in capacity to respond. Uh, by uh, different sectors of, uh, of our society. Um, no model, no, we really don't have a model, right? It's, uh, and that's why this was so difficult because we're actually asking developing countries in the Paris Agreement to go ahead and continue to provide or increase their uh, provision of well-being in all of its uh, ramifications, uh, continue to provide that for their citizens and increase their well-being and by the way, don't do it the way we did it because we've been doing it for 150 years and we now realize that that was not a very good idea to do it you know, with high carbon intensity. Well, so then they turn around and go, well, so show me who's done it right. Well, you can't, you don't really have those models. And so we're asking developing countries to do something that is completely unknown to our job, completely unknown. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why this was so difficult, so difficult because there are no models to go forward and because developing countries have very different, uh, you know, very different reality. And to take your, uh, your, your kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, but all of the other Gulf countries, you have to understand these countries went from abject poverty to unimaginable wealth in a few decades because they discovered hydrocarbons, right? Because they discovered that they had oil and gas. And now the world is turning to them and saying, by the way, that which is your only source of income, only source of income, we don't like that anymore. You're gonna have to change. It's a huge message for those countries. Now, fortunately, they have realized themselves that they are actually benefited by participating with all of the rest of the countries to arrest climate change because they happen to live in a very, very hot area of the world. It is already hot in the Gulf, and it's going to become even hotter. And even they will not be able to provide air conditioning to everybody who needs to, because they will be having heat waves that are actually beyond human, uh, beyond human capacity to withstand if climate goes to the extent that we know that it could go in theory. So I must say I really uh, very much appreciate the effort that is being made by these uh, hydrocarbon, by these fossil fuel exporting countries, particularly those in the Gulf that have no other income currently, um, to diversify their economy, to begin to understand that they want to continue to be energy exporters and energy providers, but that that does not necessarily mean that they are gonna be fossil fuel energy providers that there are other options for them. And the investment that is going into renewable energy, in particular in Saudi Arabia, is really quite dramatic. Um, so I think you know I'm giving you a flavor of the kind of transformation that every country has gone through to understand what are the impacts for them, which are very, very different. The impact on Saudi Arabia is completely different from the impact on Tuvalu. But each
each of them has understood that they are better served by a collaborative approach that, uh, because they know none of them can solve climate change individually, right? It just doesn't exist. Either we all solve it together or we all don't solve it together. And for them to have come forward after so many years of discussing and trying to understand this and say, okay, we understand. We're better off collaborating with each other and understanding our differences, respecting our differences, respecting our past, but joining hands as we go into the future and not forcing everybody, anybody, into a future that is exactly the same as anybody else. I tend to think in pictures, and so if you will, um, Paris, the Paris Agreement, what it does is it builds a very broad highway with many, many different lanes. And it says to every country, you take the lane that you want. You want to take the slow lane, you want to take the fast lane. Everybody can take a, because Tuvalu can't do the same thing that the United States can do. In fact, Ecuador cannot do the same thing that, the, that, uh, that China is doing. Very, very different realities in each of their countries. So the fact that you have different speeds of engagement, different lanes, if you will, around this highway, and different vehicles of engagement, each one of those INDCs, each one of those climate change plans, denotes a very, very different choice, unique choice of policies and measures um, that, uh, that they're going to be enacting a very difficult, a very different vehicle of engagement for each of them. And yet, all moving in the same direction. Hence my analogy of the highway. Everybody moving in the same direction because they know that they have to, that it's better for them, uh, and that it's better that we do it together. So, um, yes, and to your comment about multinationals, well, I think you gave yourself the answer, right? The fact that uh, Steve Howard was the one uh, from IKEA who said, we've peaked on stuff. Well, if that is not a statement from a multinational corporation, a corporation that sells, as he describes it, stuff, right? And so he stands up in public and he says, whoa, 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 I represent IKEA, multinational corporation, and I want to admit that in industrialized countries we have peaked on stuff, or we should peak on the stuff that we buy. Uh, true leadership on the part of Steve Howard and IKEA and many other multinationals. You know, it's very simple to just take, you know, multinational corporations and stick them into a box and say, ah, they're all evil. Or in fact, it's very simple to take whatever, you know, lens you use and take a group of countries and say, ah, they're all evil. That's very simple. But I'm going to tell you, that's not the way we're going to solve this. Every single multinational corporation has to take a step forward. Every country has to take a step forward. And that's what we saw in Paris. If there is something absolutely remarkable, unprecedented, historical, is that everybody accepted their responsibility in Paris. Whether they were a company, an insurance, a corporation, an, an industrial corporation, a manufacturing company, an insurance company, a bank, uh, all of the civil society, everybody stood up in Paris and said, we got it. Finally, we got it. Every one of us has some degree of responsibility. That does not mean that every single company of the world, no. But you do have a growing number of companies that have really understood this. And all social change occurs like that. You never have everybody come forward at the same time. That just doesn't occur. That's, that's not the way human nature happens. You have always pioneers that lead the way, and then you have a few, few pioneers that lead the way, and then you have a huge wave that comes right behind them. And you will always have some in the back who do not want to, uh, to move forward. <coughs> but it doesn't matter, That's, uh, that doesn't uh, stop the world from moving forward. So um, I'm deeply grateful actually for every single country that took a step forward, for every corporation, for every sector that has demonstrated um, their way to, to, uh, to accept their responsibility and be able to benefit from it. Um, well, you can imagine on Gossip of Paris, um, we, we, that's something that we should probably do with a glass of wine. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, but here's what I would like to say about that. Uh, this was my sixth uh, conference of the parties COP uh, that I've had the, uh, the honor to, uh, to direct. And um, here is what was very different from the first five. In the first five uh, that took us you know, from 2010, right after Copenhagen, I assume the responsibility right after Copenhagen, 2010 to 2015, um, and, um, and, uh, 
um, or 14 rather, uh, I was never 100% sure that we would get to the point, because uh, as an exercise, the secretary always figures out after each COP what is the next step that they need to guide countries or encourage countries to stay um, at the next COP. Um, and I was never really sure whether we would be able to get to that over the first uh, five COPs. We did, uh, because all the stars aligned um, and because there was a lot of support from outside, but I was never 100% sure. In fact, in every single COP, the last three days are a completely sleepless, forget about sleep, I usually forget about food because it runs out. Um, and, uh, and, and maybe that's why we come to agreements because, you know, a lack of a sort of a modern way of uh, to di diplomatic torture, I guess. Uh, you know, you can't sleep, you can't eat, so just agree so we can all go home. Um, that's one way of doing it. But um, we always were able to get to where we needed to uh, after a lot of very hard work. Um, but truly with the feeling that we were squeezing through a very, very narrow, you know, threading the needle very, very narrowly. We just barely made it in, oh, huge relief, huge relief, barely made it in. Completely different in Paris, right? In Paris, one, by the time, we, in fact, by the beginning of last year, January of 2015, I already knew that we would get an agreement, and I was very, very public about that. I know that we're gonna get an agreement because there was that much political will there was that much support from civil society, from corporations, from the banking side, from everybody, um, that I knew that we didn't have an option but to get an agreement. And then my battle started to be, let's get not just an agreement because I don't want just a photo opportunity, let's get an agreement that is actually worth our effort. Let's get an agreement that is actually gonna make a change, that is actually gonna make an impact on the trajectory of emissions and on the quality of life on this planet. And that's when we started our last battle. And you know what, by about September or October, knew that we were going to get that ambitious agreement. That's an amazing thing. And the last three days um, that are always sleepless and foodless, there were a hundred thousand things that went wrong. I can't even begin to tell you how many things went wrong. And yet, I never got butterflies in my stomach, which I usually do, because I knew that the force for good, that the tsunami of actually healing this process was much stronger than all of the things that were going wrong. And we had to, you know, oh, this monster raises its head. Okay, let's deal with that one. That monster, okay, let's deal with that one. To the last minute. I don't know how many of you saw this on, on television, right? But even when, you know, this thing was gonna be adopted and everybody was in the room, and it took us an hour and a half to finally gather. We said, why? Because we had three emergencies in the room. Most people didn't even notice, right? They were <laughs> running around trying to figure out, okay, which, um, and solving those three last, uh, those three last uh, dramatic events there. Um, because we knew that we had to uh, take this on uh, unanimously. But I knew the whole time that we were gonna get to an agreement because humanity has risen to this challenge. If there's one message that I would invite you to take away tonight is um, there is a lot uh, that is happening in this world that we can be uh, concerned about, that we can be sad about, that we can be angry about, that we can be cynical about. No absence of that. And the fact that we have this agreement of not just 195 countries, but everybody, the whole context with them should be a reason <coughs> for hope. It is a, it's not the final solution, it is not perfect, but it sure is ambitious, and it sure points the way into uh, a completely different way of working with each other. So there is reason <coughs> for hope, and uh, those of you who are younger than 59, which I am, uh, which is most of you, please do take a message here of hope, of um, optimism, and frankly, of love. Interpret it not as love for those of you who you know, your family, your spouse, your kids, your grandparents, but love for humanity. Because ultimately, that is what we have. Thank you.
many, many thanks. I think that was uh, an inspiring uh, presentation, uh, one that also paints very clearly the role of the United Nations at its best, uh, not able effectively to be confrontational, not able to force governments to do what they don't want, uh, but able to shepherd them, able to cajole them, uh, and finally to get what obviously is a historic agreement. I want to make one point, and I hope it's not unfair doing it at the end, uh, which is your comment that human rights had to be in the preamble rather than in the substance because there is a lack of agreement, I think needs to be unpacked in a way because there is agreement on human rights. There is more agreement on human rights than there is on climate change in formal terms. Every country in the world has ratified a whole range of human rights treaties. None of them get up and say, we don't believe in this stuff. They all say the exact opposite, perhaps in stronger terms than they do about climate change. The problem, and we have to recognize that, is political that states go in and they say, it's not in my political interests. I might be sued if I put human rights in here. Or I might get those stupid women thinking that there really is gender equality uh, and that they will do something domestically. So I think we need to distinguish between the politics of it and the, and the form. Anyway, on that note, uh, I want to thank you all for coming. I, I think this is uh, an extraordinarily important uh, event. Uh, we in the human rights community very much hope that the, there will be forward movement, despite the interests of a number of key states, uh, in emphasizing the human rights aspect, which I think uh, blends absolutely perfectly with your closing words, that it's love for humanity, uh, it's solidarity, and that's where the rights dimension of climate change comes in. But thank you so, so much for all you've done and for being tonight.